All right, so I'm going to open the Capital Improvement Planning Committee meeting at 5.31 p.m. Uh, this is a hybrid meeting in the uh, municipal offices and via Zoom. Meetings normally held at municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means to uh, of public access and when, where required. Public participants provided in accordance with the governor's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, MGL. Chapter 30A, Section 20, meetings are typically broadcast on Frontier Community Access Television. The remote uh, meeting information is as follows. The dial-in number is 312-626-6799. The meeting ID is 911-604-1580. And the passcode is 570012. Um, meeting attendees should mute their phones, star six for landlines, unless... Asking questions or commenting, all attendees should wait to speak until all their participants are finished. All right, everyone. Um, so we are um, going to mainly focus on um, uh, SCAN stuff today. Uh, we're going to skip the minutes for now. Uh, Skip still has to uh, pull those up from the last meeting or we have to get them over to him. Uh, so in the next meeting, we'll uh, just review this meeting's minutes um, and last meetings. So in terms of um, FY 2023 and 2024 capital projects, um, like I said, we wanna look at the SCEMS uh, items that are coming in. And uh, we have uh, the chief here. I'm just gonna pull up the requests. And I uh, just wanted to give- um, Can we do introductions? Yeah, actually we, oh, we can. Uh, so I just wanted to give everyone some time uh, to meet and. Like Denise had said, we can do some some intros here, which would be good. So I'm going to need a second just to find this uh, uh, list of requests. Anyways, hi Denise Mason. Hi Denise, nice to meet you. Um, I'm Chief Smith. Uh, for those that know me for a long time, uh, Zachary, but I actually recently changed my name to Zoe. So either Zoe, Z, Chief Smith, anything like that would be fine. Um, appreciate it. Um, thank you. I, my understanding is you wanted to keep this meeting short, and that is my Gold. Um, I'm not that sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I do. Yeah. Um, I have, um, as previously stated, three requests here. One is actually for the current fiscal year, and then two for the upcoming budget season. All right. And uh, I am Mark Brennan, chair of the Capital Improvements Planning Committee. And Skip Olmstead. Pleasure. Uh, Carolyn Ness, a select board rep. Great, and I am now caught up. So thank, thank you, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so um, I guess uh, what we can do is just go over. Uh, you said that you had one for this fiscal year. Yeah, the current FY twenty three. So let's start with the twenty twenty three request. Sure. Uh, the backstory here is we have three ambulances in the department. Um, two are currently equipped at the paramedic level, the ALS level. Um, and we staff paramedics 24 7. That third ambulance is at the basic life support level. Uh, and that is the ambulance that would normally do um, football game standbys or if there's a major event, multiple car accidents, multiple calls simultaneously that would be uh, pulled into service. Um, we were looking to add the capability to provide paramedic level service on that ambulance as well. Uh, right now, when it responds, it's responding with paramedics, but we're unable to perform that level of skill because we're actually missing a cardiac monitor. Um, and um, also additionally, with that monitor and being able to provide that service, the revenue that we're able to bill for that service for health insurance is significantly more, almost $1,000 more. So there's this return on investment um, as well. So we were looking uh, at adding a third life pack to our life pack cardiac monitor to our inventory for all three ambulances. And while researching this, uh, we found out from the manufacturer that the two life packs that we have, which are currently about eight years old, normal life expectancy for this type of medical equipment is 10. Um, but they said that the generation of that life pack while current um, used a previous manufacturing technique for the circuitry, the circuit boards, which um, was harmful to the environment. So they, they changed manufacturing process, which results in our current monitors uh, actually being unfixable. If they have a problem with the circuitry in the monitor, parts are not available, full stop. They don't manufacture them. Um, so 
I brought this to my board of oversight. South County EMS, we're a department of the, uh, the town of Deerfield, um, but we are governed by a board of oversight by Deerfield Summer and Waitley. And said, well, here's our problem. We want to add a third life pack and also these other two, which were due for replacement in upcoming years, are non serviceable. And uh, the turnaround time, if we were to order one today, is about a year out. So, right? So we're stacking all these problems. Um, and the Board of Oversight, uh, after deli deliberation, voted that we should put a order in immediately for three life pack monitors that would replace the ones that are currently non serviceable and are due to be end of life in about two to three years. Um, and bring that third ambulance up to the paramedic level. They also voted that we should fund this out of the retained earnings that we have available currently on hand. Um, so the approximate 150,000, the latest quote is like 46,000 and change uh, for each monitor. Mm -hmm. um, so the $150,000 would come from retained earnings. Uh, that is money that is already on hand in our enterprise fund. And it would allow us, if approved for this uh, fiscal year right now, to per put in an order for these three now in anticipation of receiving them a year from now, um, based on the current manufacturing turnaround. Um, we are also concurrently, um, we have a SEMA uh, National um, Firefighting uh, Grant in place requesting $50,000 for a monitor. Uh, and we are also submitting a request with the Regional Homeland Security Advisory Council this week um, for also another $50,000. So the 150 out of retained earnings is assuming that we are not awarded either of those grants as well. Um, the turnaround on those grants, the federal one would be summer, fall. Mm -hmm. um, that's when it, we could know as soon as basically tomorrow that we're awarded, but they <laughs> award it through all of spring, summer, and fall. Um, and then the Homeland Security grant closes uh, like on Monday or Tuesday, they're voting on it. And I believe, so we might know as early as then that we have that money available, but not wanting to rely on those ifs and maybes. Um, that's why this, this was voted on by my board of oversight. Any questions about this request or? Yeah, so, okay, so you said you have $150,000. So do you have, even though you're ordering them now, do you have to put a down payment on? Do you have to pay for them now? Uh, no, the, the payment is due at time of delivery. Oh, okay. um, by ordering them now, we would lock in the price okay. um, that they are now. Um, but we aren't allowed to order them unless we have the money, you know, either voted on or approved or something right. like that. Okay. Yeah. Carolyn, if you don't mind, uh, what this is the first time that I've heard this, but we've had situations with other departments where we've had capital items that we are ordering, but we won't receive in the current fiscal year. So, well, um, just like we ordered the Freightliner for Kevin last you know under um last year we voted yes even though it's in the um process for next for next for this 24 the reason why is because it was such a savings i think it, what did kevin say 50 or 60 thousand dollars savings well this is similar the prices are going to go up we know that once one of these monitors breaks that we can't um you know, have bill at um, advanced level service, um, you know, the paramedic level, not to mention the fact that if we had a cardiac patient, we wouldn't be able to save them. So um, we as the oversight board, even though I'm the fiscal agent, I don't vote for it. I was 100% in favor of this because we had the money in the bank for, um, you know, the 250 for the ambulance. However, the ambulance is 375 now. So we were going to be short anyway. So the idea is let's just take care of this life pack, which we know we have, are going to have a problem. Um, and, you know, it's a year out. So it's not like the money, we're taking the money out of the account, although we have the money. Um, it's just uh, getting in line to pay. And if we decide not to do it, then <coughs> fine. We can just not 
um, when we get to the top of the line and they're ready to deliver to us next year, then we can say, no, we're actually don't want them. But I, I, we felt getting in line was critical and locking in the price was critical because all this stuff is skyrocketing in price. Um, but I will have to tell you up front that um, I'm on the Homeland Security Council and, uh, and on the equipment committee, as well as the planning committee and, and the training committee. And I would say uh, this is not gonna be a positive vote because it's a precedent setting. We can't, the Homeland Security money can't replace um, you know, equipment because there's just too many um, towns that need equipment. So even though this is a good argument because we're a three community EMS and all that, I would have to say it's not going to get voted on positively probably. Yeah, and I think um, the the um, AFG, Assistance to Firefighting Grant, that's what the term I was looking for, um, from the federal government, uh, we're kind of in a similar boat with that while it's a relatively small amount of funds compared to what is normally being asked for, we're competing with again, you know, communities from all over the country. Yeah. So uh, we have a very good shot at that in a very, very tiny percentage. Um, so we're not counting on that either. And I don't know if, if the question also, if we approve this money now and then we roll over to the new fiscal year, it just remains approved. It will sit there. It has been appropriated. We have the funds on hand in our enterprise fund. So if and when they are delivered 12 months from now, it's... it's no, that's, it, it was that, it's that situation where we're actually not going to receive it and we're not going to pay for it right. until 2024. I think it should be in the 2024 budget as opposed to the current 2023 well, the only thing is, if we order it, we order it. This doesn't get voted on. This this capital project uh, list doesn't get voted on until um, town meeting, and and it and you can't put the order in until July first. And then, so who knows what the price and where we would be in in the line? I think the t intent of the board of oversight was that we need to get in line right now. And so it would, uh, yeah, come under, yes. and it would come in under the 2023 um, capital um, requests. Right. And since it's coming out of retained earnings, we don't have the problem of needing to raise an appropriate at town meeting. We have the money on hand. We would just be, if we, if we wanted to put it in the FY24, we would just be putting off that actual order that many months, and then we'd be that far behind again. So. I'd like to explore that, but basically, you know, under, with the assumption at least that you know, since there's no money going out, um, it's like the ambulance. We put money aside for the ambulance, yeah. and we don't. So the ambulance that we're going to vote for in, at town meeting, uh, that is not going to be paid for until 2024 at the earliest. Um, correct. Yeah, but I can't. I can't order it until I have the funds on hand, um, or like I have. I have the means to pay for it. Basically, that's something I'd like to. Okay, that, that was my understanding of having researched this. No, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I'm ready to take a look at it and uh, run it past Tommy and, and and see. I don't. I don't think we could even get in line. Up. Did, wasn't the ambulance wait time? I mean, we, we can talk about the ambulance when you can. Yeah, we'll get to the ambulance. We'll get yeah. to the ambulance. So I'm just saying that situation where you're you're putting an order in now, but I'm not sure that we. What I really want to know is whether we have to appropriate the money now. That's uh, all. I think so, because legally you can't put an order in unless. I mean, we have to set aside the money. There's a two, what I don't know, there's 200 and something thousand in there, 250 something. So we have the money. So we would now uh, set aside 150 by our capital vote as well. I mean, Boo has already voted that. The oversight committee has already voted to set that aside. Now we're just, as the capital improvement, we're just acknowledging the, the Boo's request. Makes sense. It's it's no additional money 
requested. And if we do that for, when were you planning to put the order in for the ambulance? It would, it, well, the ambulance is on the FY24. So at town meeting, if, if and when it is approved by the voters at all three town meetings, then I would turn around and call the next day and put in that, put in that authorization for manufacturing. But we don't have the money. So, you know, we weren't gonna, or at least I didn't think that we were gonna put, actually have the ability to put the order in. We, should, can, we will get to the ambulance. Yeah, we can, yeah, yeah let's, yeah, that's it. Because yeah. I, I do, we do have some positive news on that, Skip, so. So how many ambulances are you staffed to run right now? Like, can you run all three? Is it two, one? Uh, the short answer is we are staffed one paramedic ambulance 24 seven. Um, we add additional staffing during our busier hours, which is uh, about 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So we add staff then. And then any sort of um, like shift change overlap, um, Depending on our staffing levels, I might be an extra person on during the day administrative wise who can also respond. And then all of our um, football game standby, special events, craft fair, vaccine clinics, things like that are all handled by the third ambulance to maintain those two other ambulances in service. The other thing is because in, in order to, to cover our minimum for our 911 requests, which go up about 10 to 12% a year, we need two ambulances staffed, which means you need a third ambulance, because if one goes down for service or needs to be um, decontaminated or something like that, then we pull that third ambulance into the rotation. Um, and so right now, because that third ambulance is just the basic level, um, it's either if we think one of that ambulance is going to be out of service temporarily, we're only going to run at the BLS level. If it's long term, then we have to move all of the equipment over um, and and it's just it gets mm -hmm. right. Um, and, and and we've been caught, you know, sometimes it'll go up for an oil change, you know, it should be done in a couple hours, no problem. And they get up there and they find like, oh, you need a you know, wheel bearing or something. And now they have it overnight. And it means that we're down um, to a BLS truck because we don't have the additional equipment for the third. Um, does that answer your question? I just kind of, yep. I like to hear myself talk sometimes. So you're, you're, <laughs> you're welcome to be like, okay, we got it, we got it, we got it. <laughs> I'm just wondering what you attribute the, what, what did you say, nine to 10% increase in calls each year? Uh, year over year, pretty wow. pretty consistently. And our uh, our mutual aid, which is the responses to other communities, mm -hmm. went up 57% over last year. So that's, uh, that's, that's a difference of about one mutual aid call a week to, you know, one and a half, mm -hmm. you know, or yeah. that, that type of thing. Um, but it is... There, there are two major factors at play. One is just the community is aging. I mean, this is a national trend. Right. Um, I would say three, three factors. One is aging population. Um, two is a reluctance on primary care doctor's offices to see sick patients. Mm -hmm. So it used to be, you know, if you had a cold, you'd call your primary care, they'd say, come on in. Now they say, oh, if you have symptoms, we want you to go to the emergency department or, um, urgent care. And um, so when people hear emergency, they call the ambulance. Uh, and for a lot of our community, a lot of our marginalized communities, their only access to health care is to the emergency department. And a lot of these marginalized communities also, you know, might have multiple parents, but only one vehicle or no cars at all. So their only ability to get to the emergency room is with the ambulance. So then we see an increase in call volume that way locally. And then our mutual aid partners, there is a, um, we are a public agency, just like a police or a fire department. We are funded through uh, taxation and then offset with revenue from medical billing. Um, but there is such a thing as private ambulance services out there, and their primary revenue stream is your non-emergent interfacility transfer. So if somebody needs to go from the nursing home to dialysis and back every single day, that uses an ambulance, uh, but in a non-emergency role. And the cost of bandages costs the same for everybody else. The cost of um, personnel costs mm -hmm. the same. So the only way for them to um, maximize profits, because by definition as a private company you need to do that, yep. is to 
reduce the amount of personnel they have on staff. And so that's what we've seen in communities, particularly to our north, that have a private ambulance service for 911 care. Yeah. Um, they run a skeleton crew as often as they can, because mm -hmm. any idle time is, is profit loss. Right. Um, so that means that if they get a little bit busy uh, above their average, um, then they are relying on their neighboring communities to cover their calls. And that's why we end up going to Greenfield and, and uh, other communities. What does like Greenfield have for ambulance? How many ambulances yeah. do they have? And how do they stand? That's a great question, Skip. Um, their primary 911 service is contracted with American Medical Response, which is a mm -hmm. private company. And the Greenfield Fire Department itself runs two basic level ambulances. And per their licensing, um, they are allowed to, they are not allowed to respond what we call primary. Um, they are only allowed to respond and be the only ambulance responding if AMR isn't otherwise available. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what AMR runs typically. I think it's typically two ambulances um, at a time, um, but just today we responded twice to Greenfield uh, Mutual Aid, um, and that is you know, if they need two ambulances to cover their calls and they send one from an interfacility transport from Franklin down to Springfield because that's where the money is, mm -hmm. now they can't cover half their calls. Um, and so that's that's kind of the situation that we're looking at, and which is why we see communities like Greenfield and Turner's looking to do what we did, which was at their own native um, public department. Um, do we provide backup service for Turner's or? Uh, we do in a similar mutual aid capacity. Um, and actually today we, we took a patient, uh, a trauma patient to Springfield. We had another call come in at the time and Greenfield fire came down mutual aid. And so that mutual, that being the key mm -hmm. word, right? When that works out, it, it makes sense. Because if you could cover all your calls 100% of the time, you'd be overstaffed. Um, so that type of mutual response is perfect. And now that the general peer spread is open again, uh, um, it makes the ability for us and Turners to be more mutual um, a better option as well. Um, okay. So give or take $150,000 gets us three, whatever they are. Three life pack um, cardiac monitors, yeah, with a life expectancy of 10 years on those. But so we can say 15, is that just the model number or? Uh, yeah, it's a life pack 15 and LP 15. Um, that is what they are. Sorry about that. That kind of looks like I'm asking for 15 cardiac monitors. Or it's a 15 year <laughs> monitor. Yeah. No, it's, um, it is the model number. Yeah, so um, that's a good representative of, of the generation that they are. Um, and Yeah. Any other questions before we uh, move on? I do have a question. So yeah. if you've got a monitor and I, I know they're in the eight, year eight of 10 year lifespan. Mm -hmm. So what happens, you go out and you try to use a monitor and all of a sudden it doesn't work. Uh, on a like a, a specific case like that, we would call for another ambulance. Um, just um, the the monitors themselves, they perform a self diagnostic check at 3 a.m. every single day, and those okay. checks are logged at the beginning of every shift. Um, the crew members come in and check their equipment and also do another self diagnostic so check. Know. Oh yeah, a hundred percent, and and they get um, annual preventive maintenance as well, where they are rehabbed and, and they are checked by a certified tech from the company. And these, I mean, these are like FDA approved cardiac defibrillators, right. yeah. you know, synchronized cardio version, you know, so um, we keep them on a very uh, tight leash. Um, so we, we would know, um, we would know before, like that, that they would need to come out of service before okay. something were to happen. Um, and, you know, additionally, with having multiple ambulances and multiple monitors, mm -hmm. you know, if one crew were to respond to the scene, get on scene and find that the cardiac monitor was not working, right. it would be a trivial matter for me to jump in the SUV, grab the second monitor or the third monitor off the truck 
and just deliver it to the scene within okay. you know a minute or two. I was just thinking about liability issues. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we currently <laughs> have <laughs> two <laughs> monitors. Correct. Yep. Yep. And that the third that that monitor is is the hurdle between for that third ambulance being at the ALS level. Um, mm -hmm. Everything else that goes on an ambulance that makes it a paramedic level truck, you know, we're talking about $1,500 worth of additional equipment. You know, we have most of that already because we have overstock in our department. So it is that monitor that's that's keeping us. Um, so if we don't have it, we're actually losing money. Uh, one could argue, yeah. The um, Certainly, like I said, the we are responding with paramedics, so we're already paying for that level of education and training on the truck. Mm -hmm. When they are forced to perform at the BLS level, our standard uh, ambulance insurance um, rate for that, I think is like 370 or $400 in billing that the insurance company gives us. If we give them a cardiac monitor and they can put it on the patient doing nothing else, that increases that revenue to about 12 or $1,300. Um, so I, this is one of the things that came up in our board of oversight discussion was, uh, you know, quite frankly, that third ambulance isn't going to be utilized enough for me to sit here and say it'll pay for itself. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certain some, certainly something to consider. Right? Now, um, would you, do you have to use the monitor in order in order to build? Yeah. Uh, yes, is the short answer. Yeah, okay. um, you have to perform an ALS level assessment, okay. which requires a paramedic and a cardiac monitor. So we're already sending the paramedic there, that cardiac monitor, and like literally four stickers, and then we interpret your EKG and we can do things like that. So the, the additional cost to us is for these little electrodes. The reason that yeah. I ask is that sometime last fall, or maybe it was last summer, I ended up, I was in Greenfield and I ended up passing out. So the ambulance came and by then, you know, I managed to get up and I was wandering around. Yeah. It was like, yeah, we're going to go to the yeah. hospital. But I spent at least 10 minutes doing, getting that all hooked up. Yeah. And yeah, doing yeah. that uh, monitoring. Yeah. And it was almost like I kept thinking to myself, why don't you just drive me? The hospital. This is that's the one. So okay. this is this is a great point because as paramedics and with this cardiac monitor, we can assess for things like that you're not only having a heart attack, but specifically the vessel in your heart that is occluded. And so we're able to determine that in the field. And the statistics are very clear on this. If I if we go to a patient in Deerfield and we do that by their side where they are before we start exerting them or asking them to move and we determine that they're having a heart attack, we are allowed to go directly into the catheterization lab at Bay State in Springfield. We bypass the emergency department. They, they trust us. They know that we can assess these patients and we go right into the catheterization lab. Even when we know it's a heart attack ahead of time. If we go in through the doors at Franklin, there is regulatory requirements in, it's called Intala, that they transfer the patient to their care, they assess the patient, and then make a decision that they need to go to Bay State and transfer them out. So even in a perfect world, usually we are in the catheterization lab in Springfield before we are leaving again Franklin in route to Springfield. And that's why it seems like we could we could be there by now, you know? And when it's nothing, when you're not having a heart attack, you're absolutely right. You're like, we've wasted 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but for those patients who are having a heart attack, it gets them to that catheterization lab half an hour, 40 minutes even faster. So it, it's, it's pretty really, stuff. It's really, yeah. a, it's a quality of life issue. It's how fat, if you the if you can get there and get treated within an hour, then you're going to likely have the ability to be recovered. And so this this purchase is to make sure that our residents have quality of life, not only just response, but quality of life. So oh no, no that was not this was a, you know, at, <laughs> I was at somebody's house and uh, it was a <laughs> three minute ride to the hospital. And I almost felt like, why did I just drive up there? Because yeah. I was, and it was, it turned out it was not cardiac related. Mm -hmm. But how would they know? I yeah, I would, that's right. Yeah. You know, um, 
Yeah, and I think I if it's scary. I didn't talk about the enterprise fund at all. I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with it, but South County EMS is set up as an enterprise fund, meaning that we are fully contained with this one account, this enterprise fund, and wholly responsible for all of the costs associated. So if you look at my normal budget, we include things like employee benefits, uh, other post-employment benefits, OPEB, things like that. Um, so it's totally transparent. To the three towns and part and because we have a revenue stream that revenue stream from billing goes back into our enterprise fund which allows us to offset the cost of our service right now our service costs about 1.3 million dollars to keep the lights on and keep the ambulances staffed and it costs the member towns i i half that six six hundred thousand just because we offset it with that billing revenue and the enterprise fund allows us to do that part of that also just like the town would have like a free cash, um, we have retained earnings. So mm -hmm. when we have revenue above and beyond what either we estimated we would get or we underspend a line item, it rolls back over. And that's how we've historically funded the ambulance. So we allow that money to accumulate over the years. And it is a, is a chunk of money that the Board of Oversight then says, this is how we want to spend this money back into the service. So that's where the money for this is coming from. This, this $150,000 currently exists in the South County EMS mm -hmm. Enterprise Fund. Um, and so the approval is that the CIPC sees the value as did the Board of Oversight, um, but we're not asking for money from the taxpayers or from free cash or anything like that. Um, it's definitely an education for me, Enterprise <laughs> Funds, that's for sure. <laughs> Has there been any thought in buying one of these once every three years as opposed to buying three every 10? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the long answer is we find ourselves in a lurch right now. These two lap, uh, these, these two life packs were purchased with regionalization grant money um, in 2012 or 13 thereabouts. Um, when we voted to regionalize and create South County, we needed a lot of capital investment just to put everything together. And so two monitors were purchased with that, which means that they were going to time out end of life anyway um, together. And my plan here initially was to, well, let's get a third one. We'll buy a third one now. You know, we'll put that up to frontline service and then we'll start staggering. With the news that these are non-repairable, that's where we find ourselves in this position where it's like we could buy one, but then we'd be just as bad, if not worse off tomorrow, if one of them fails its daily check or something like that. Um, certainly with the year replacement schedule, you know, even if we had the money on hand and did an emergency um, expenditure, the company would say, great, 12 months, we'll put you on the list. I'm just sort of curious. So they said it's it's a uh, better environmental, environmentally, better environmental practice for the manufacturing, or is it just planned obsolescence? No, it's it's not planned obsolescence. The the circ whatever the the sub company that they have that produced the circuit boards for this device, the process of manufacturing those circuit mm -hmm. boards was destructful to the environment. Whatever chemicals they were using, wherever they were doing it. Yeah. And so they switched vendors or the vendor changed their manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. But it was in such a manner that it, they aren't cross compatible. So when they, they switched this manufacturing process, the exterior of the monitor looks exactly the same. It functions exactly the same, but the guts are different. Right. Um, and they are certified by the FDA under a different you know, process. And so that means that they had a stock of these circuit boards on the shelf apparently for a while, but as soon as that stock ran out, um, yeah. there's nothing we can put into our monitors yeah. to fix them. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, let's. Uh, Move on to the next one. Uh, did you want to go with the IV pumps or the ambulance? I would like to do IV pumps um, first. This was actually a request that we, did I make a note here? We requested this um, a number of years ago, uh, 2017. So in 2017, um, 
Department of Public Health of Massachusetts, the Office of Emergency Medical Services, which is our regulatory body, uh, put in a requirement that we carry medication pumps. And right now, when we give a medication, just like you see in the old movies, there's like a drip chamber, and we count how many drips a second you're getting, and we do some math, and we figure out what the dosages you're getting. That sounds safe. Yeah. Um, um, your, yes, your tongue-in-cheek comment um, <laughs> led to the requirement of medication pumps, and, and basically they were saying, what are we doing? Like, why we have this technology um, we can dial in exactly the dosage that we want to give somebody. So they're going to require. Um, at the time, they were about $7,000 a piece back in 2017. Uh, and so we put in a capital request that was approved for buying three of them for all three ambulances um, for $21,000 uh, in FY18. At the time, there was no FDA approved pre hospital vehicle use emergency medicine pump available on the market. And so DPH said, I know this is a requirement, but we're going to like keep kicking that the deadline down the road until a pump becomes available. Well, guess what? I'm sitting here today because not only is there an outstanding pump available that has already been adopted and fielded by Northampton Fire and, and uh, AMR, um, actually, um, but they are uh, significantly less expensive, um, where three of them can now be purchased for $7,000. Whoa. Um, so um, they are a third of the price. Um, they are FDA approved. Um, the, the specific ones are, do I have this? There's Sapphire um, is, the, is the name of the company. And um, again, this money is, uh, would be coming out of retained earnings. Mm -hmm. So I, so this is for FY24, um, but this is money that does not do, need to be raised and appropriated. The Board of Oversight said, oh yeah, $7,000 out of retained earnings, no brainer. It's required equipment anyway. Um, and now that this is available, we need to make this purchase. Um, and it's gonna be basically um, no cost to anybody because we have been anticipating this purchase and we've had this money set aside for it. That's that very quickly. Uh, any questions about the pumps? I guess my recommendation here would be um, if you know we move forward to do it, maybe within a couple of years, think about purchasing a fourth one and getting on yeah. a three-year cycle if this is a 10-year expectancy. Yeah, uh, that's great. Um, uh, we had a... It was dated a few years ago. We had a capital replacement schedule floating around someplace, um, and and things have just you know with this monitor development, things like that have blown up. But yeah, um, staggering these replacements is is absolutely the right move. Um, yeah, I, you know it's it's required by OEMS. I mean that alone kind of ties our hands, unfunded mandate, you know, as they like to say, um, but not, but it increases safety and decreases liability as well. I mean, mm -hmm. from the comment earlier, we're not trying to count drips in the back of a moving truck. We can give exactly the chosen. And, and these pumps are used for some very, um, very delicate uh, medications um, that it's, it's incredibly important to, yeah, to administer them. I was gonna say, I've got 15 minutes left. Yeah. Oh. Go to another meeting. Let's talk about ambulances then. So ambulance. Um, so uh, normally what we do is, uh, so that retained earnings, um, we always estimate how much we're going to get from billing um, revenue. And we, we're always very conservative on that because we rely so much of it for our normal operational funding. We don't want to overestimate and then come up short. But because we are uh, conservative on it, it means that we typically have a little bit more, uh, assuming there's no pandemic or something like that. And we put that money aside. And historically, our ambulances have cost $250,000 a piece. Um, the state recommends that they are replaced after 10 years uh, of service uh, for a number of reasons. One is wear and tear. Uh, two, co become cost prohibitive to continue repairing. And three, the advancements in technology as far as safety in the patient compartment for both the patient and the providers advance so quickly that 
at 10 years, you're basically not meeting the standard of care anymore in the pre-hospital emergency center. So we have three ambulances. Um, we are not as busy as some other departments, say an ambulance store in Northampton. So we look at a replacement schedule that none of our ambulances hopefully will be older than 12. So we are on a four year replacement schedule. So every four years we would buy a new ambulance that would become the frontline truck and we would bump them down. So that third line truck that is pulled into service rarely or for special events or, or the occasional significant emergency would be the oldest of, of the three. We put enough money aside, so after four years, we would have $260,000 to cover the cost of the new truck. And in the last 12 months, 14 months, the cost of that new truck has gone from $250,000 to $375,000. Um, it's, it's crazy. And we are not alone here, right? So multiple departments are scrambling now to figure out what is going on. Um, most are saying, you know what, let's delay this purchase, you know, a little bit longer and we'll mm -hmm. keep these trucks in service. Um, unfortunately for us, our oldest truck um, that needs replacing uh, is a 2007, um, which, what does that make it? Uh, 16, 16 years old. Um, it's a 16 year old truck. It was inherited from the Sunderland Fire Department when we regionalized. Um, uh, and it was already six or seven years old then. And the we get inspected by the Department of Public Health every year, and the inspector was on a creeper underneath that truck, shocked that the frame was not cracked in a specific spot. He saw the age of the truck and he goes, ah, I'm gonna take this thing out of service right now, watch this. Uh, and our only saving grace is that we've tried to not to use it as much as possible um, to keep it in service. So. We are up against this wall. We need to get this truck replaced. Um, the next major repair that is due for is turbo and EGR valve. And our trusted mechanic at Northampton Ford, who works in emergency vehicles, um, estimated that repair, I think he said somewhere between three and seven thousand dollars, depending on what they find. So it's it's almost getting to the point where not only is it costing us more to keep in service. Um, but also we might be forced to take it out of service just because it's... Now, is that the ambulance that we were signed up to when you put on here? Correct, yeah. Um, and if it is out of service, that means we don't have that third truck in the rotation to cover our needs when one... Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it really puts us behind the evil. Is there any traded value on that? Uh, pennies. I mean, we're talking about three or $4,000 probably, and it would be a goodwill measure. Um, really, if, if they wanted to do that, it would just be sold for scrap. Um, so we are already behind the eight ball. We were, we were looking to have $260,000 available um, for the FY24 year. We come up against this immediate life path replacement problem uh, and the Board of Oversight said, okay, well, that is more pressing. We have two good ambulances. Um, we need to make sure that we can maintain life packs for those ambulances. So we're going to prioritize that, um, which means that we have less money now in retained earnings available for the ambulance. Um, less to the point of we only have $100,000. So normally in the past, we would come to town and we'd say, we want to buy an ambulance, but we have all the money on hand. We just need you to rubber stamp it. The Board of Oversight said, this is the reality we're in. Let's at least put it to the three member towns and let them make a value judgment on their own behalf. We don't know what they have in stabilization and free cash, um, what the, their values are. Um, and so that is why I submitted a separate capital budget to the three member towns, which divide the expense up based on our intermunicipal agreement for the month. So a $375,000 ambulance, we have $100,000 available to us in retained earnings, the difference being 275. That would be the amount that we would need to ultimately raise and appropriate to cover the cost of this ambulance. But based on the assessments for the three member towns, Deerfield's share is 142,343, and then Sunderland's is 86,500, and, and then Wheatley's is $46,000. Now, because of the way our IMA works, 
all three member towns have to vote and approve this. So if Deerfield and Sunderland said, yeah, absolutely, we want to take some money, this is a good investment, and Wheatley says we can't afford it, well, it's dead in the water um, as far as this goes. If we can find another funding stream to offset the cost and, and come back to the table, um, then that would be a discussion to have their time. That AFG grant with the feds, um, the monitor is actually a micro grant built into the larger grant for this ambulance replacement. So we currently have a grant in place for the full cost of this ambulance replacement. But as Carolyn alluded to earlier, um, we can't count on that money. We're not a shoe in for it. Mm. Um, talking to our representatives in DC, they think we have a good shot, but the likelihood of anybody getting this type of grant is very small. So it's like, a good shot at a very small chance. Um, and that's why we brought this capital budget uh, to so everybody. Does the 275 include the 50, a $50,000 cardiac monitor? No. No, okay. No, this $375,000 is to purchase the exact same truck that cost us $260,000 three years ago or four years ago. Um, that is um, built to our department needs for our coverage area with patient and crew safety in mind. And by our third truck, because we inherited from Sunderland, is diametrically different from our other two trucks. So the third truck would be a sister truck consistent through um, operation and placement of equipment. So that way, you know, you, you always want to limit that extra cognitive load on your paramedics. And so Having them climb into a vehicle and have everything in the exact same spot reduces our liability and things like that. Um, so that's that's why we spec the trucks the same way they always do, and that's um, yeah. So um, the, yeah. The one good thing is that um, we found out that USDA they don't have any money this year, but it, we need to put the application in to get in line for this coming uh, money. Uh, their their year is uh, end of September, September thirtieth. So supposedly there's going to be new money. And with the IRA money, the Inflation Reduction Act money, I believe the money is going to the USDA agency, rural development, so that we could um, get, I mean, I feel like we would have a really good chance to get our ambulance paid for by a USDA um, uh, grant. And, and if not, we can get a USDA loan for at least some of it being subsidized, we would have to match some. But I, I, I think we could get the full amount because it's a three-town um, EMS service, which is very uh, we are, yeah. We are very attractive being a truly regional um, yeah. cooperative. Um, and, so and we because, are very yeah. And because we respond mutual aid to the whole county, that yeah. also is huge. So you know we fit. Uh, I mean, we get a lot of points right off the bat. So I, I think we're going to have a good chance of that. Um, Denise was in that meeting and was and heard about it. So didn't, didn't you say or didn't someone say that Montague got that, got a couple last year? Yeah. In case it's not a two last year through USDA, through this. Okay. We just didn't it's know. Our leftover money. And it just so happened that Steve found it when he found it. Um, Scott Soares did did caution everybody that was an unusual occurrence. Well, that's that's what it, that's what I was saying it's last true. time, Carolyn. And I wasn't really clear on. Yeah, I think whether it, was there was one. it doesn't it doesn't matter. We just put the application in and we start agitating for it. You know, get our legis has send Jim McGovern down there to talk to him. Whatever, they'll they'll make sure it gets through. Okay, this or is the, we have this, a decent shot. Yeah, this is a very easy grant, I think. I mean, I, I really feel optimistic about the grant because I was, I have to tell you, I was really depressed about this ambulance because this, you know, this cost just skyrocketed, uh, you know, in the last few months. And it's like, you know, we, we had this cycle where we're going to be on replacement and then we're, we're $110,000 short. And it's like, this is ridiculous. So anyway, um, Scott met with us, Scott Soros, who's the head of the regional uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts office. And he he told us about it. So we'll put an application in. So Carolyn, do you know when the applications come out? Um, I We should put it in for now because then it's in the pipeline for the money 
uh, I can do because sometimes sometimes it's a different application depending on the year. So we find you out through Scott's work. In, you put it in, you fill out the information, you put it in. Doesn't matter. We already know the money's been spent this cycle, but you, they, that gives them official heads up that we're in the next cycle. And one of we, our most recent full-time hires, uh, not only is she an outstanding paramedic, she is also uh, like a terrier um, to grants. Oh, good. Um, so she is aggressively pursuing all of these grant opportunities. Nice. And so yes, I'm hoping that we will start being so able to realize. Fill that out. Yes, okay. I, and she's I know already been in contact with our USDA rep and is already uh, working those channels yeah, as well. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, I think every single one of these things here. Um, I mean, aside from the pumps, um, but everything else, we are aggressively trying to find a funding stream that is not, you know, through station. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so, uh, how, what's the lead time on an ambulance? Like, if I want to go to the ambulance store and get one, that's a great question. Um, uh, last time I heard, I was quoted over 700 days. Okay. So, would this be like an FY25, 26? This would be. In order to order it, my understanding um, is that we have to have it approved at town meeting. So mm -hmm. last time we ordered it, we met at town meeting, it got voted yes. The following day I called up, I said, put that order in. Mm -hmm. The turnaround time used to be right around seven months, six months, um, and we are now out past 700 days. Um, and the holdups on that are raw materials on the box and then the chassis themselves. Um, because you know they come on an F four F five fifty, they purchased that from Ford. Um, I don't know whether production is starting to catch up on that, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it, we might not see it delivered for another year or two. Um, which you know, to replace a two thousand seven ambulance puts it out now. You know, potentially close to a twenty years. Twenty years is what it sounds like. This yeah, is what I was asking. Yeah. So. Um, when it when it comes to um, this uh, same kind of request for you know Sunderland and Whateley, you know, do, are, are are they going to be even be able to vote on it um, before their town meetings this year? Uh, I'm not in. You mean like from a capital committee perspective? Yeah, either that or, or for town meeting. Do you know if you know this is in the pipes for those two towns? I have. Presented at Sunderland already uh, in front of their finance committee and select board. I have not presented in front of Whitley yet. Um, that will uh, come up. And I I did not hear any. There was no discussion in the room or indication in facial expressions that they were like, oof, this is not <laughs> happening. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know where that's settled yet. Um, if any one of the towns says that we can't, uh, bring it forward because of the way the IMA is written and this cost sharing and uh, and balance. Um, we would have to revisit this problem in totality. I don't think it would be as easy as just saying, well, okay, well then, here for them, Waitley, do you want to split it 50 50? I think it would it'd be more involved in that. That would be something for Sounds the board. Good to me. Yeah, yeah. Be good. That, that's something for, um, you know, I would bring that to my board of oversight because. That has representatives from all three towns, and also, you know, this this budget, these requests were approved by by my board of oversight, which is comprised of select board members, you know, from all three towns, um, and so they were aware of this and and brought it to the table and approved it themselves. So, I hope we may know something, <laughs> but I can't, I don't know yet. You're gonna turn into a pumpkin, so, yeah. Oh. This is way more interesting. Thank you. Well, I don't know. Yeah. So, I would I would like to get some more financial information, not from you, but from yeah. from, from the town. Okay. Uh, and then, so, thank you. particularly since you're leaving, we don't have a quorum. Well, we, we do. We have we have a quorum. Uh, Douglas here. I'd like to kind of hold off the vote. I don't see I don't see any. Oh, we're not voting. We're, we're not voting today. Anyway. Well, no. recommendations. Okay. No, nope. we're gonna do. We're gonna start those in the next meeting. <laughs> okay. We're we're looking at everything, Skip. We're, or we decided a couple of meetings ago that we were going to look at everything because we know we don't have enough money. So that's fine. Uh, we wanted to look at everything and hear everyone's story, then make a decision on priority. We're also still waiting for DES, Skip. Uh, we just got Frontier uh, Elementary School budget. We just got Frontier. 
um, we should have some ed we should have some informed knowledge by the end of the week about elementary school. So do we have anything else we're going to look at? No, we don't. Thank you very much for coming in. This was uh, very insightful. I appreciate oh, it. Well, like I said, I'm I'm happy to talk shop whenever possible. I hope I didn't um, capitalize too much of your time. Yeah, but I like that. That's all fun. Uh, great. Um, so yeah, our uh, our next meeting is going to be on um, on the 14th, and then we'll have another one on the 16th. Uh, Casey. Mark, I have to miss the 14th. They reschedule. I had some tests rescheduled. Um, yep. I will be able to do the 16th, but not the 14th. So okay. we'll work with Chris on that. And At what time? 5 30? 5 30 for both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's like the parade committee. <laughs> nope. Nope. Um, yep. Yeah. I don't know where, where it is, but yeah, we're, we're capital. We're out of here in a few minutes. Yeah. So um within five minutes or so. Yeah. So uh we'll um reconvene on the 14th and um hopefully uh the advertising either the 14th or the 16th. We need to basically be ready, assuming nothing changes with town meeting dates. Uh we need to be ready to present our capital plan to the finance committee and select board by the 28th. Um, just so everyone's aware. So March, uh, yeah, 28th of March. So um, we don't have any meetings scheduled yet for the uh, the week of the 20th of March. So when we get in next week, um, I want to tee up some meetings like we did uh, a couple of meetings ago, just to finish out that week of the 13th. Um, yep. I'm sorry, the week of the 20th. All right, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to do we have a second? I'll second that, Carolyn. All right. Uh, so all those in favor, you have to go one at a time. Yes. Skip, yes. Carolyn? Carolyn, yes. Chuck? Chuck, yes. Mark Brennan, yes. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're adjourned.